The time is 1210 on Friday, November 13th, 2020. The place is the virtual Zoom. Um, I cannot call it an invisible college now, can I? The virtual Zoom event for the Berkeley Network for a New Political Economy. The star is Matthew Klein, co-author with Michael Pettis of the book, Trade Wars Are Class Wars. And Matthew will be playing the role of avatar and second coming of John A. Hobson. Matthew, as I understand the core of your book, it is that the governments of the United States, Germany, and China chose respectively to be a high deficit economy, a weak domestic demand economy, and a low import, higher export economy. Now, the US government chose that, chose to be a high deficit economy in the 1980s as the quickest path to achieving Reagan's principal policy goal of tax cuts for the rich. But the other two, when, why, and how did the German government choose to become a weak domestic demand economy? First of all, Brad, thank you very much for, for hosting this. It's, it's great to, you know, be here virtually. Uh, it's, I guess the first event I've been doing that's local to where I live, even though we're, you know, in mm -hmm. the cloud, as it were. Um, you know, to your question, I think that there's an element in which choice is, uh, you know, we don't want to overstate it too much one way or the other. I completely agree with you that it's useful to understand the U.S. economy as being one characterized by macroeconomic deficits of various sorts, whether in the current account, which really combines all the different sectors of the economy or specifically in the federal government, and that looking at the macro policy mix that began in the 1980s in terms of tax cuts and higher military spending was very much uh, contingent on that. But I think it's also, you know, part of the point we make in the book, and I think this sort of fits in, you know, the Hobsonian idea is that those deficits were partly a reaction to developments in the rest of the world, and that, um, you know, this is also something that we see in the context of, you know, what happened with Germany, you know, to, to your question. Yeah. I think it's really useful to, to understand the evolution of the modern German economy as a reaction to the fall of communism and the falling of the Berlin Wall and, and how the German economy, West Germany responded to that. And one of the things that happened that was, you know, essentially a disappointment for a lot of people in West Germany was that there was this hope that the integration of the East uh, combined with West German democracy, West German technology, West German managerial expertise would lead to a really rapid growth, really big increase in profitable investments and a rapid convergence in living standards. And that didn't really work. Now, it's true that by a lot of metrics, the gap between East and West Germany in terms of living standards is actually pretty small compared to, say, Northern Southern Italy, or for that matter, Northern Southern United States. It's not a mezzo by any means. Right, right. It's actually, you know, from a lot of perspectives, you can say it was a success story. But at the same time, you know, first of all, it took a long time to get there. And, uh, you know, the initial reaction was that uh, most of what the sort of business capital in East Germany had to be you know, written off, that there really wasn't a lot of things up there that were valuable that people thought they were you know, selling things for scrap. And there was a massive layoffs. And ultimately that redounded uh, to economic weakness in the West. And German businesses responded by, you know, essentially not at, at the, this early stage in this like cut wages, but they would try to cut hours. There were, you know, unemployment rose pretty dramatically in the West. It wasn't just an East German phenomenon. And, uh, you know, at first the government responded with a sort of some sort of offsetting, you know, stimulus of various measures. But, you know, because of the Maastricht Treaty and the creation of the euro, they ended up becoming constrained in their ability to do that. And by the time you get to the early 2000s, you have a situation where the German government doesn't really believe that it has agency to act to do sort of traditional macroeconomic stimulus, the weak economy. German businesses are just incredibly scared or incapable of making domestic investments. German households uh, have already been running down their savings rates in the 1990s, but you know, with fears of layoffs and fears of coming cuts to social security and so forth, weren't there wasn't really a lot of scope for that any further. There wasn't a housing boom in Germany, unlike basically the rest of the world in the 2000s. So there wasn't really scope there. And what ended up happening was that the German export economy, which is a relatively large part of the total, continued to sort of crank along in line with global GDP growth, which was slower in the 2000s than in the 90s. But that the domestic economy was very, very weak. And so that mechanically led to an, uh, a shift in Germany's external position. So you had a situation where basically from the you know 1950s through the 1990s, either small surpluses or small deficits, mostly you know relatively balanced um, to a situation where the Germany's trade and current account surplus ended up hitting you know, eight percentage points of GDP. 
Um, and the third partner in what we can't call Chimerica because it or the the, the you know, triumvirate. Yeah. Um, how did the Chinese government push the East Asian model far beyond what I at least had thought the possible bounds of the East Asian model could be? Um, when, why, and how did the Chinese government arrive um, at the policy configuration that drove its entrance into the world economy and turned it into the China shock? Um, so one thing that's interesting there, I mean, it's it's called the East Asian model. And I think that the reason is because it was sort of popularized by, I guess, when Japan did it first, uh, and then, you know, Korea, Taiwan, to a lesser extent, China. But, you know, as, as my co-author, Michael Pettis, will tell you that it really precedes uh, the use in East Asia. In fact, arguably, you could call it a Hamiltonian model mm -hmm. um, to a varying degrees, you know, uh, but Michael likes to talk about Alexander Gershenkron, who is a Ukrainian mm -hmm. economist writing about this in the 50s. And basically, the idea being that if you're a relatively poor and underdeveloped society, the, what you need to do is you need to invest in fiscal capital. And the way to do that, the most straightforward way is you essentially squeeze households um, get some kind of surplus there and then, you know, redirect economic activity from sort of serving basic consumer needs to business investment or, you know, government investment, whatever you want to call it. Um, you can think of enclosures as a way of doing that. If you go further back in time, um, you can think of, I mean, quite frankly, the collectivization under the Soviet Union under Stalin was a way of doing this, which obviously you won't think of that as being capitalist per se, but, you know, capitalist versus socialist doesn't really apply to this. That distinction doesn't really matter for, for this, this model. Um, and, and, that's, and, it's, and that's an interesting point because if you look at what happened in the Soviet Union in the 1930s where you know, millions of people are starving to death, that was basically the last time you could see a large economy in which the household share, in the household consumption as a share of economic output was as low as ended up going in China. Which is remarkable because obviously, you know, China now is not characterized by mass starvation was in the 1960s when they tried it, but that's that's a different um, story. So, you know, the question of how they ended up in, in this situation, I think that this is where you get a mix of sort of the the sort of politics and the pure, you know, economics. I, you know, after um, Deng Xiaoping and his colleagues came into power in the late 1970s, there were, you know, you had a situation where for well over 100 years, China had been devastated by wars and revolutions and civil wars and Great leap forward and foreign invasion, all sorts of you know foreign imperialism, colonialism. You could go back, I mean, at least to the 1830s if you wanted to, and, and that led to a very sustained period in which, despite the levels of education, institutional quality, and so forth, that investment in China was very, very low. So by the time you get to late 1970s, there was a real mismatch there, and so, and at the same time, you had all the repressions of Maoism, and so all you, that had been holding back economic activity for decades. So you let up on that. You don't have to do anything pretty dramatic. You're just going to get essentially sort of a mean reversion um, and pretty rapid growth. And that's what you saw in the 1980s for the most part, uh, which was you know, rapid productivity growth because you just simply let some repression off of the agricultural sector, which was the dominant part of the economy. Problem was that there wasn't a commensurate liberalization of the urban industrial sector that led to a lot of mismatches in terms of you know, particularly big increase in food prices. You have other, you know, issues of political instability stemming from, you know, not people not knowing really how far liberalization was going to go. The things, you know, the things that led me every ten years to predict that the Chinese model has only ten more years to run, and so right. I've been wrong forty times in a row. It's... Yeah, and you get to uh, that's you get to a moment where you had, you know, rising instability and crisis, and ultimately, you know, you get to the the violent crushing of the pro-democracy movement in 89. You know, there were protests before 89, by the way, just they didn't have the mm -hmm. same kind of dramatic end. And you have sort of orthodox communists coming back in and trying to roll back reforms. And you get sort of the closest thing that China's had to a, a recession basically until, you know, this year, um, where growth, GDP growth just slows dramatically in 89 and 90. And at that point, you know, the Orthodox communists are discredited, but you sort of need as a new approach. And the question is, how are you going to generate rapid growth like you had in the 80s, but without sort of the ensuing political stability? And the compromise that people seem to have come to, and, you know, this is where I'm drawing on the work of people like Richard McGregor, who's really, you know, in the party really studies, the, knows a lot more about Chinese politics than, than I ever will in the ins, ins and outs there. But essentially the compromise was, well, 
we can have the elements of a market-based system and the gains that come from that, but still have the party in control of economic power and therefore political power. And arguably that insight, you know, that comes from, you know, the Hungarian economist, Janos Kornai, who, you know, the Chinese brought in in the, in the eighties to give them, you know, this insight, which is that you can have market competition, all its benefits and still maintain, you know, a party state. And that's essentially seems to be what they did. But of course, if you're going to do that, how do you have this sort of concentration of economic power and rapid growth? Well, you know, you sort of update this model, what they call it, East Asian model or Gershon Krohn or what have you, where, you know, you're concentrating economic power and benefits into businesses, state on, whether state enterprises or not, government enterprise, you know, local governments. And, you know, say, if you can borrow cheaply and invest, you'll get access to artificially cheap labor because well, the state will basically be on your side to suppress wages. Um, and as long as the investments are worthwhile, you know, which when you're a very poor country, most investments will be, this works very well. The challenge, of course, is as time goes on, the investments, you know, finding worthwhile investments without sort of making deeper reforms to the sort of political system become trickier. Yeah. And that's where you get to, you know, the problems more recently. Yeah. I mean, now when Matt and I start to bore each other, I'm going to switch on over and start asking people, other people's questions out of the chat window. Um, and so if you have other questions, ask them in the chat window and I'll switch over at some point. Um, now, um, given the options open, I'm, I have my definite very strong feeling that there were much better policy options open to the American government than to those it has pursued in the age of neoliberalism since Reagan's election. Um, but for Germany and China, um, given the situations those countries found themselves in, um, were the choices they made good ones or were they the best of a bad set or were they choices that were clearly inferior to other political economy policy choices they could have made? Well, this is where I guess the question is good for best for whom. So, I mean, the, you know, the title of the book, Trade Wars or Class Wars, the presumption is that, you know, the core argument of the book really is that thinking of all these things as country versus country, where everyone in the country is basically the same set of economic interests is, is going to lead you down a lot of, you know, incorrect analytical paths. And that it's really more useful to think of, you know, economic sectors or classes within countries that are competing against each other. And that oftentimes you're seeing sort of transnational cooperation among elites, you know, globally um, created. In fact, you can see, I, I think quite plausibly, if you want to understand, you know, what the past 30, 40 years, it's easier to say that, well, the system that was created may seem like it was dysfunctional and problematic for a lot of people, but it was very good for rich people in the US, rich people in Europe, rich people in East Asia, you know, in different ways, but that's sort of how it ended up. And, uh, you know, with the net result being rising consumer debt, supporting an increase in corporate profitability and, and so forth. So the question of, you know, could Germany or China have done things differently? I think the answer is yes. Um, they would have involved different kinds of trade-offs though. So one thing that I find really striking is that if you look at the period in which Germany's current account surplus balance goes from essentially zero to this massive surplus, so like 99 to 2007 or what have you, that perfectly coincides with a very, very, very large increase in the profit margins of the German corporate sector. Basically, I don't know if it's completely unprecedented, but it's very dramatic in that in the, in the kind of short period of time that it occurred. So clearly it worked out well for someone. Um, of course, and that's essentially because, again, if you have businesses that are just selling to foreign customers who aren't dealing with your own domestic problems, and then you're not paying workers anymore, you're not doing any capital spending, that's going to sort of automatically accrue to profits for yourself. And then it just got essentially saved by um, German you know, family-owned businesses and then channeled through the German bank system somewhere else, and then they lost a lot of money on those investments. So even for them, maybe it wasn't necessarily as good uh, a choice as it could have been. And then for China, you look at again, what happened and you'd say, well, on the one hand, you did have very rapid growth. There were a lot of really useful investments that were made. At the same time, there were also a lot of wasteful investments that were made. There's a lot of environmental destruction that didn't need to happen. In fact, the government in the past 10 years has spent a lot of effort to try to undo it um, to varying degrees. There, the, the fact that Chinese officials basically going back at least as far as 2007, saying that our economic model is a problem. It is unsustainable. Uh, it's leading to these increases in debt that are going to be bad and, and we need to find a new paradigm. We need, you know, the fact that this is the people at the very top of the Chinese leadership making this point makes me think that there probably was a better way of doing things. And in fact, the, the extent to which they are still relatively reliant on external demand to 
you know, deal with sort of their own dysfunctional political economy makes me think that they, they would have, there, there were better approaches. The Chinese case is a tricky one because were those political choices or those economic choices excuse me, consistent with their political goal of having the CCP maintaining a monopoly? And that's where, you know, you'd have to ask someone. I mean, that's a tricky question. I don't really have a good answer for you. But, you know, from that perspective, again, you can say maybe they did make the best choice. But, you know, that's this is where, again, you know, for whom is really the sort of the key can answer your question. Although I would push back. Um, actually, I would like to say that the social democracy inflected mixed economy up until 1980 certainly produced as fast rapid economic growth, even for the rich, as the neoliberal inflected mixed economy policy choices since 1980 have. Um, that since 1980, the riches' absolute income share appear, absolute incomes appear to have just continued to grow at their post World War II generation pace. It's everyone else you know, who's gotten cream. But if you think that the best of all things you can buy with your wealth is a relatively quiet life, and if you think about the likelihood of class descent, um, among one's children and grandchildren, it's a much less comfortable world for today's rich and perhaps even the super rich out there now than, say, simply a straight line ex, um, extrapolation of what you know, income patterns and wealth growth would have been like in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, yeah. And so the question of why these decisions were made. Um, how was it that you know, inequality pressures and pressures to increase inequality um, prevented these countries from doing what I would think would have been the normal thing, which was simply try to rebuild the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s social democratic consensus? Um, That's a great question. I mean, I, I agree with you that in sort of expected value terms, it's yeah. probably better to have you know kept the sort of pre-1980 economic model for if you're a rich person than than not because of the you know the risk of extreme dissatisfaction that you know could lead to big changes and you know to quote uh you know Marion Eccles when because these aren't new problems I mean he was talking about this in, in the 1930s that what's the point of saving if you uh, have nothing that's worth saving you can own these assets that are essentially going to be worthless because there's no no one willing to buy what they're capable of producing you know especially you know and if you're talking about increasing debt to make it happen which is sort of the key element one of the key mechanisms we describe in the book again you know that's not obviously better for a rich person than than in a world where they don't need that kind of increase in debt to sustain the value of their their assets i you know i think that there's an element here i think what you're getting at is that there was also sort of intellectual change and that there was sort of, you know, whether it was the zeitgeist or whether it was sort of, you know, elite academic opinion or what have you, that there were changes there that also explained some of these shifts. I mean, one thing that's interesting is that, you know, at least in the German context where we can actually see very clearly what the arguments were. Um, I don't know enough, you know, I think that a lot of the stuff in China is probably sealed somewhere, but at least in Germany, you can look at it and it, it's clear that the argument wasn't, we need to e increase inequality because inequality is good or anything like that. It was more that they were looking at sort of discrete policy choices. They were thought they were dealing with this in constraints and that they each sort of seemed to make sense at the time. And then, you know, cumulative led to an outcome. And, and one of the concerns, for example, that's been going on for a while was, you know, the German federal debt was rising too much because of the social security payments to the East. And so, uh, you know, it can't go on forever was a view. Of course, maybe it actually could have gone on forever given sort of the other dynamics going on in the German economy and the path of interest rates. But at the time they thought it couldn't go on forever. And so that was one thing that they felt they needed to fix. Um, there was also a view, a little more reasonable, but also I think still probably incorrect in terms of the implications was that, well, we're a rapidly aging society with slowing population growth. In fact, probably falling population growth in the in the not too distant future. Therefore, we need to focus on saving to provide for our future. But again, if, if the way you do that is essentially by cutting investment in you know, education and, and broadband, and you then put all the money into you know, Greek government bonds and subprime American mortgages, that's not really a good way of dealing with that either. But at least you, know, you can see that as sort of a rationale. So I think that that's, and, and you know, there was also 
you know, as you were getting it, there was a belief that some of these changes would just lead to more growth. That, you know, I think that it's, it's really, I think, a, a telling point that, um, you know, when Schroeder, the, the Gerhard Schroeder, who was the Social Democrat Chancellor um, in Coalition of the Greens, I guess it was in 2002, I think, was um, or the very, you know, early 2000s, one of the first responses that they had to the economic downturn was a corporate tax cut. I thought we need to have, you know, that that's the thing that we're going to do that will increase investment. And, <laughs> you know, if, if that's the sort of view of what they think is going to work, I mean, you know, I, yeah, there's clearly, that's an interesting question of how that, how that happened. Um, and, you know, I don't have a great, you know, and it, there are intellectual histories that have been written about, you know, why people's minds change and what they're reacting to. I don't know if we have like a perfect answer, but I think that's definitely part of the story. So I should go back and I should look again at you know, Helmut Kohl's masterful playing of his political hand to get the extremely rapid absorption of the German East in a context in which both Russia and America were still very mindful of, um, was it Talleyrand's um, saying that he loved Germany? He loved Germany so much he wanted there to be many, many, many of them. Um, <laughs> And Helmut Kohl thought that he had made unsustainable financial promises about the terms on which the German East would be absorbed and how much their life would improve immediately thereafter, um, which essentially would require that the Bundesbank tolerate a little inflation for a little while and a little bit of low interest rates for a little while because Otherwise, the alternative would be extremely, extremely painful as the various bills came due. And yet it turned out that after the absorption of the Germanies, when they went to the Bundesbank, the Bundesbank said no. The Bundesbank said, not only are we not going to allow any inflation in Germany, we are going to destroy the exchange rate mechanism. Um, yeah, that it's... was a key part of the 1980s attempt to pull the European economy out of its doldrums, out of its doldrums of the kind of Volcker disinflation. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, your point about how Helmut Kohl played his hand, and one thing I got talking to, you know, some people I know in Germany is there was an element of which he did a very good job, but also the extent to which the pressure from regular East Germans to come to the West sort of meant that there really wouldn't have been a realistic alternative, no matter what, you know, no. Thatcher. I mean, may, may, I don't know, like it would have been hard to, but yes, I, I agree that he did, you know, achieving that very quickly. And it's funny, actually, you look mm -hmm. at the speech that, that he made sort of laying out the framework for German unification. And it's some of that stuff sounds very much like the kinds of things that German policymakers said in the 2010s about, you know, the response to the Euro crisis, which is, you know, there's these, we are willing to provide help, you know, solidarity, but there has, you know, there are fundamental structural problems that need to change and without reforms, you know, there's not gonna be any money. And obviously in the case of East Germany, like that makes clear sense that they're, the, none of the businesses there really were viable, but it is definitely, you know, that, that sort of through line there is interesting. Um, I mean, one thing that's, you know, and to your point about the Bundesbank, I mean, yeah, they, they rose interest rates uh, to the higher levels than they did actually during the, you know, peak of the inflation in the 1970s. So it was a pretty extreme reaction. Um, I think, you know, it's an interesting question to what extent the, and the British thought so. Yeah, yes. right. I mean, the consequences of that, you know, flowing through and from, you know, blow of ERM to Brexit, you can probably draw a line there to a degree. But um, yeah, the, the extent to which the events are connected in sort of surprising ways is one of the fun things about, you know, looking into this and writing, writing this book. I think on the German, one thing I would say a little bit, though, is that I don't know exactly how wrong the promises that Cole made mm -hmm. were himself as opposed to sort of the execution afterwards. And so one thing that's kind of, you know, you go back in time and you see funny, you know, things from people, you know, uh, sort of cameos, if you will, but like Janet Yellen in 1990 wrote a paper looking at, um, you know, German wage policy and the viability of each German firms and basically found that part of the problem was that you had these big wage hikes after the exchange rate had, you know, switched to come into effect. And so that the exchange rate at the time when it was proposed, the one-to-one -one exchange between Ostmarks and Deutschmarks actually would have been okay, except then on top of that, there's this big pay increase. And so, um, and then in fact, those continued for several years and then basically none of the businesses were viable. And so, you know, things like that 
and again, you can sort of understand if you look at sort of the individual choices and, you know, incentives that different parts people were making in the time, like why that happened. But at the same time, it basically meant that suddenly none of those businesses were viable. And it's, you know, sad and ironic because now actually East Germany is quite, you know, productive. It's not like nobody does the things anymore. There's plenty of, manu you know, manufacturing and other industries in East Germany. It's not, you know, this sort of complete ward of the state. It's, but there was a lot of destruction on, on the path there that probably could have been avoided to a degree. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I started by accusing or complimenting you on being the second coming of John A. Hobson, right? And indeed, these arguments have been made before, right? That inequality and the desire of a class that controls the government effectively to maintain and increase inequality is extremely damaging to the ability of a market economies of a market economy to grow and produce acceptable macroeconomic performance. And it will show itself in all kinds of weird reactions. Um, but if I recall Hobson, Hobson, if I recall correctly, was trying to account for you know, imperialism, militarism, arms races, you know, real war, real wars. Um, and Thank God, for the most part, we've managed to avoid that. Um, so how is it that the forces that in Hobson's mind, you know, impelled, the, impelled a turn toward negative sum international relations in his era, um, how is it that we've managed to tame them to such a degree? That after all, you're just talking about trade wars. Yeah, so first of all, credit work credit is due the, the link between sort of Hobson's view from the early 20th yeah. century and the modern period was made by Kenneth Austin who was an economist mm -hmm. at the Treasury Department writing about China essentially as the uh, the, the peak of, of capitalism in, in, in its relation with the rest of the world so mm -hmm. you know we're following on that uh, you know insight from from Kenneth Austin <clears throat> I think one interesting difference and this is I think something that was essentially surprising you know, I think it's in sense surprising that it's been the, that it's still the case, but that, you know, in Hobson's time, the way that the inequality and the and the sort of dysfunctional side effects of the inequality in you know England, France, and Germany was dealt with was by relations with colonies and quasi colonies, and essentially forcing those people to varying degrees to absorb excess production and take on debt. Uh, to pay for it, and thereby also creating an outlet for the rich savers in, you know, Western Europe. But that required violence. It didn't always require violence. So you look at sort of Canada and Australia, and to a lesser extent, the United States, those, those were mutually beneficial voluntary transactions. But if you look at Latin America, well, India, the, the well, aborigines of Australia, yes, depending, Indian yes, or Indians yes, might yes, disagree. Yes, that no, that's ownership absolutely. of these resources, so you could invest British capital to exploit them, they did not drop from the sky. That's a that's a very good point, um, but I guess more more consensual in those cases for some people who live there relative to say what happened in India or China or, or Latin America or Africa, um, and the thing that's different more recently, which is in, you know an interesting and arguably arguably good, but that there, it's it's you know it's much more um, consensual that the 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 costs of being economically speaking, sort of a subsidiary part of, of an em empire, whether, you know, inc which includes, by the way, the United States being in sort of that subsidiary position, um, people seem to be, or enough people seem to be okay with it, they, that it was allowed, that even in a democracy, that these costs were, you know, sort of not happily absorbed, but they were absorbed and people didn't really push back on it that much. I think you can look at sort of the past 10 years as being an element of people pushing back on it to varying degrees. Um, but in general, it was something that was allowed. And so that sort of meant there wasn't really a need for the would-be you know, economic imperialists, if you will, to resort to violence. So even though they are competing over market share and so forth, as long as you can find you know, American consumers willing to borrow a great deal to, you know, to spend and buy trinkets from made elsewhere, then that will sort of act as a balancing. And that's been a difference. I mean, I still think that there's potential. I don't think that the trade wars, as people talk about them, will lead to shooting wars. And it's certainly not in sort of a mechanical necessity, but I think it's also fair. I mean, this is a point that, that Keynes made writing, 
you know, in between Hobson and us, but to make the same point essentially, which is that to the extent that you have economic weakness, the extent that people are fighting over sort of scarce global demand, businesses are fighting over scarce global demand and, and governments are trying to make sure it's their businesses that get it. You know, that makes the international situation relatively less stable and relatively more prone to violence. And so, you know, while in some ways the world of Hobson, the world of we live in is are very different in other ways, you know, you can see there's sort of linkages there. So that in some sense that you're, that you can see China, Germany, America, others as fighting over who's going to get demand in times in which demand is relatively slack uh, in order to maintain full employment and growth. And you also can see them in times when demand is not so slack, but in which you know, funds to finance, funds to finance investment um, is the place where there's weakness as fighting over who and how is going to get to deploy the investment profitably. And this is the context in which you can say that Reagan with his tax cuts in the 1980s created a situation in which when the United States is not suffering from high unemployment, it is suffering, it is being starved of funds for investment for the next generation. And so we're always faced with the choice of either having slow growth because we won't be investing much in America or borrowing the money to invest in America and to maintain the consumption of the upper middle class so it doesn't feel like it needs new governors, um, that it's achieving those two at the price of massive manufacturing and capital imports from abroad, and thus deciding that Midwestern manufacturing is going to get hammered, and then hammered and hammered again, as it has been at least three times you know, since 1980. Um, and, you know, that's, I think, the main reason that, you know, I see very little good um, coming out of the Reagan administration's policy decisions. Um, but you gave an explanation earlier of why Chinese and German were, if not the best, or at least understandable, given the constraints that their countries were in. Um, not so much, but largely the elites. Um, is there anything that those who think that the Reagan administration's policy decision was not obviously the wrong one. Is there anything for them to say? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. I, I think that I would somewhat actually disagree, push, push back yeah. on your sort of analysis of it insofar as, I mean, there's a couple elements of it. One, the extent that, that there were big tax cuts for people who mostly would just save them, you know, not use it on consuming goods mm -hmm. and services, then that shouldn't necessarily have altered sort of overall saving investment patterns in the US. It just sort of sort of shifted it from, you know, rich people saving more versus the private, you know, versus the government essentially. So the, the overall national balance sheet, it's not obvious why that would have moved. Um, and in fact, I believe an argument that was made at the time was, oh, you know, the rich people are going to be better at making investment decisions than the government. So they should have the money. Uh, you know, whether that's right or wrong, I mean, you can at least, that's it's, it's consistent. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think also for what it's, you know, if we're really going to sort of dig into these things, the, the military spending buildup probably was a useful offset um, to the other headwinds that were hitting the U.S. manufacturing sector at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be potentially, I think that if we're looking at what explained sort of the overall development in, in the trade balance and loss of manufacturing jobs, it's, it's probably, I mean, A, the combination of the very strong dollar, but also the general weakness at least in the rest of the world relatively speaking to you know demand the kinds of manufacturers that were produced in the u.s at the time and so those you know which essentially are sort of recurring themes of if you have weak global demand you know and mm -hmm. american demand is not and you know even by the end of the 1980s you know maybe by the very end you were getting closer to sort of full employment but you had a very long period of relatively high unemployment consistent with sort of the disinflation you know period so I don't so know. The rest of the world benefits massively from the fact that the U.S. is willing repeatedly to step up and be the importer of last resort. Yes, and borrower. Those are sort of the, the twin things. So the, whether it's housing debt or business debt or, or government debt, those are, you know, and, and you know, one, one of the points we, we say in the book, which I think is really, you know, useful is if we're zooming out as opposed to looking at, you know, country by country, but just globally, if you're going to be having a concentration of income, that shifts purchasing power away from people who spend them on goods and services. 
that has to go in line with an increase in global debt on a, on a gross basis, because, you know, otherwise, how is the income of the, the rich and the owners of assets rising if people aren't buying things? Well, they are buying things, they're just not buying it out of their current income, they're buying it by borrowing. And so that's why, in fact, we've seen pretty consistently, and, you know, there's a recent paper by um, Atif Mian and Amr Sufi and Ludwig Straub that looks at this, and, you know, you can see pretty clearly that there's a pretty strong link between the rise in inequality, concentration of income, and the rise in debt. And essentially, you can sort of globally think of it as rich people lending to sort of the middle class and the poor, either directly or through government debt. And, you know, is that sustainable? Is that the optimal way of organizing sort of a, a market economy? I would say, you know, there are probably better ways of doing things. Well, it certainly has produced the euthanasia of the rentier, as John Maynard Keynes would put it. You know, that is my friend, co-author and patron, Larry Summers. Um, also, in a sense, the second coming of John A. Hobson. Uh, in his view, it's you know, slow productivity growth, growing monopolization, and also rapidly rising inequality that creates this world in which there's this enormous demand for safe assets um, of one sort or another, and in which you cannot get a return from simply owning capital and investing it safely. You know, you have to bear risks you may or may not understand or have acts of entrepreneurial genius as well, which seems to create a sort of status anxiety among the rich because it seems to them that to maintain their style of life, they have to spend down capital. And that's a very psychologically awkward position in which to be. And so neither the Midwestern manufacturing workers who've lost their jobs, um, the upper middle class people who find themselves having to use their houses as ATMs because their incomes have not kept up with what they think is the economic growth they deserve, um, or the super rich whose wealth has grown beyond their wildest dreams, but who find it hard to earn much of a return on it. So, Nobody seems to be terribly happy with this. Um, yeah. That, and yeah. No, I agree. It's a fascinating point that like, it's sort of a, you know, what is the way around that problem? It's sort of a mutual failure where on the one hand, you know, and this gets back to what you were saying before, I think about, you know, the social democ, you know, social democratic market system, you know, arguably was better for rich people as well. And so far as you could actually expect, you know, growth, in sort of underlying sales of whatever, you know, the, the businesses you own uh, that will generate returns for you as opposed to essentially what we've seen more recently is it a lot of the gains in asset price, you know, in or the, the returns from owning assets, a lot of it's come from capital gains. Mm -hmm. Capital gains in particular driven by rising multiples, falling yields, what have you, which obviously is not a process that can continue indefinitely. It certainly continued a lot longer than a lot of people thought at the time, um, but, you know, presumably, no, but, you know, the hedge fund managers, I know they go to their clients and they say, well, gee, our returns are going to be low over the next five to 10 years because we moved an awful lot of them forward in time and they showed up as capital gains with the secular fall in interest rates. And right. so you can give us some slack in terms of the returns they demand and for us managing your money over the next decade and not pull your money out of our fund and invest it in someone who promised much larger returns they can't deliver. And that argument doesn't seem to work very well. Yeah, although, I mean, I, I, have, I have a lot of sympathy for that argument. I can understand why, you know, someone yeah. might not want to pay the, the fees associated with that, but, you know, I, can, but wow. I, I think that it's, it's fundamentally correct. I mean, you see this in like debates about, you know, university endowment disbursements where um, people say like, oh, of course we should expect, you know, or, or for that matter, state and local pension funding. It's like, okay, obviously we should expect, you know, double digit returns every year as a, as a baseline and, and budget things accordingly. It's like, well, you know, it's different when you have a situation where interest, you know, you're sort of the 10 year yield is 10% versus when it's, you know, less than 1% or when a lot of the gains, in, you know, stocks were trading at a P multiple of 10 versus you know, 30, like the, those things. So yeah, it's, it's a it's a challenge, but of course it's hard to get um, an adjustment because it's, it's you know, it's a collective, I mean, who wants to be the first mover to say, well, I'm gonna, or, I mean, you can't, right? You can't have a situation where companies, an individual business owner or company says, we're gonna start paying our workers a lot more and the expectation is gonna lead to higher sales growth because 
That's not how it works at the macro level. It is how it works at the macro level that if a company cuts <laughs> because they want to boost their profit margins, everyone does that, then they all end up worse off. Yeah. But it doesn't work, you know, it's much harder to get that. So that's where you need some kind of, um, you know, coordination there. But it's, uh, that's the big question, how you achieve that. I guess the answer is politics, but even that's kind of tricky. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so then how do you, it is, let me ask you to forecast into the Biden administration and beyond. Um, you know, have the stresses created by this system, you know, been so much that we don't have a good chance of simply pretending that everything Trump did in the way of trade wars was just a bad dream and go back to where we were in 2016 where the United States is organizing the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a way of establishing a solid negotiating front against China on internet intellectual property issues. But otherwise, global imbalances appear to be tolerable. And the World Economic Division of Labor continues to expand in the era of hyper-globalized value chains. Could we possibly get back there? Or will too many people say, no, that did not serve us at all? It's an interesting question. I, I, you know, and again, it probably gets back to like how one's knowledge of politics and I'm going to defer to others, but I, I will say one of the, one of the points that we wanted to make in the book and, you know, and yeah. reflecting the way we wrote it is that it's definitely not a, you know, Trump phenomenon, but this, this really predates Trump and it will likely live past him in terms of the consequences of these imbalances and, you know, the way that the, those politics are manifest might be different in different places. And, and you know, I'm not going to say that the specific trade approach of the Trump administration was particularly constructive, but, you know, there are real issues to be looking at. And I think, you know, the other thing that is a really relevant point in the book, that's, it's more of a subtext, I guess, in the book, but it's, mm -hmm. it's very relevant to your question is that a lot of what we think of as trade policy doesn't really have a big impact on trade in terms of at least the macro consequence of trade and the things that we don't think of as trade policy in fact things that are purely considered domestic are actually much more important and have huge impacts i mean the, the sort of one way of thinking about this which we this we say very explicitly in the beginning which is that you know because the globe the world is essentially a connected system anything that happens in one part of the world is going to flow through and have an impact somewhere else whether or not it's deliberate or intentional or anything like that that's just how you know, the global economy and financial system work. And so, you know, focusing on things like intellectual property rights, that is going to be very good for the owners of intellectual property assets, presumably, but will it address the, the, the pressures of Americans to borrow, whether it's the American government or American households, will it address the issue of underconsumption, underinvestment in Europe, or the very skewed income distribution and underconsumption in China? No, I don't, I don't think so. So that's, I mean, you know, and for that matter, the Trump administration's approach, I don't think would have been very helpful either. The phase one deal of essentially saying Chinese are going to buy, Chinese companies will be pressured by the Chinese government to buy more American exports. If they do that without cutting exports, their, their purchases of exports from the rest of the world, in other words, total Chinese demand rises, mm -hmm. then that would have a big impact. But there's no indication that was ever either a goal of the Trump administration or something the Chinese government had agreed to, in which case you're just getting a shift. And so Americans sell more LNG to China, hypothetically, but they sell less LNG to Europe or something like that, right? Then A, Americans are just as worse off, and B, no one else is better off. So you know, that's sort of where it's really helpful to be thinking at the macro level. I mean, the thing that I was optimistic about, and I mean, I guess I'll reserve judgment because we don't know exactly that's going to play out. But one of the things that was in uh, Biden's campaign plan mm -hmm. that was intriguing to me was this concept of if you want to help the U.S. manufacturing sector, one of the things you need to do is just increase demand for U.S. manufactured goods directly <laughs> by mm -hmm. saying you're going to commit to spending a whole bunch of money on it, um, not at the expense of anything else explicitly, but saying like, you're going to make sure that there's going to be higher demand for manufactured goods globally. And that some of that extra demand, that incremental demand, we're going to make sure it goes to the U.S. I think that's the kind of thing that would, you know, have been helpful. I don't know whether it's going to happen, um, but, you know, that, well, that kind of approach. Was, you know, the hope was that you actually have an infrastructure, not weak, but half decade. And that you also have much higher taxes on the rich, which greatly reduce the need to borrow from abroad, and so cause a bunch of expenditure switching from foreign non from foreign tradables to domestic tradables as well. Um, but 
right. That is now, I think, all off the table, um, even with two Democratic victories in the Georgia Senate election and Democrats to come. Um, that we're back to near gridlock, in which case this system continues. Um, and then does, does the system manage to rebalance itself or do people even get used to the pressures or do pressures for not Trump so much, but someone else who will produce changes in the system that will make it much more acceptable to the politically powerful people who think they are losers? Um, do those continue to build? Well, this is, you know, again, a sort of political question where I don't have special insight, but I will say that I think an interesting perspective on this can come from looking at Europe, where I would have naively thought, in fact, I did think, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, that the kinds of economic pressures that were getting inflicted on places such as Spain, Italy, and Greece would have right. led to very substantial political changes, or even in, frankly, in places like France. Yeah. And that's not at all what happened. Mm -hmm. That uh, you basically saw instead, in general, people just acclimating themselves to a world of permanently high unemployment, permanent you know, shift towards or seemingly permanent shift towards economic precarity, much lower living standards. And, you know, the closest you saw was Greece, where they elected a party that was, you know, it's the newspaper style guide, apparently, is the far left Syriza party, but which has subsequently governed in office more or less like mm -hmm. what anyone else would have done, given the fact that they didn't really have a lot of agency. Um, because of the, the nature of the way their dependency of the bank system on the ECB and so forth. So, I don't know. I mean, I guess one way of looking at this is, uh, you know, those are obviously very different societies from the U.S., but at the same time, it's tempting to say that maybe the um, in in democracies, the tolerance for pain is much higher than it used to be. <laughs> and so a lot of the things that people, you know, the the rules that people thought they had about the way governments respond to economic conditions might not hold the way they used to. But, you know, maybe that's uh, those are too different from the U.S. and I don't have a good, you know, that could be wrong. I don't know, but it's a it's an interest. It's a striking thing that you know you look at, especially as I said, Spain or Italy, and and the lack of change, relatively speaking, is uh, very striking to me. And conversely, you look at Britain, which was not among the worst affected by the Great Recession, and where the political and resulting policy changes have been absolutely immense, even if. It is basically a con job gone wrong, even if Brexit was supposed to lose, but demonstrate that the Brexit faction of the poor Tory party was committed to English identity in a way that other parties were not, and that they should be trusted by real Englishmen. Um, that losing as the tribunes of the people would not leave you with any major big policy decisions to make or disasters to confront, and would entrench your electoral position among the groups you were aiming at, um, as opposed to what's going on now, which I must say leaves me completely gobsmacked and flummoxed every time I look at whatever the current negotiating position of the Johnson administration is. Yeah, the Brexit situation is a really fascinating one. And, you know, I've been following it sort of as a you know, curious, like the way you follow a, a car crash or what have you, but uh, I yeah, mean- well, setting people setting themselves on fire repeatedly. As far as I can tell, I mean, you could arguably say there's a connection to what happened in the US in 2016, well, obviously lots of differences, but that, you know, Brexit was mm -hmm. sort of a, a result of a coalition of, of a lot of, of several groups that often had very distinct interests and perspectives on things. And then as soon as you actually win and come into power, then reconciling that becomes a complete, you know, disaster. But I, I, you know, I read an interesting paper and I remember writing about this in my day job at Barron's, I guess it was a, almost two years ago about Brexit. And essentially the argument was that the reason why, even though there were some pressures from sort of whether you call it globalization or deindustrialization or whatever, mm -hmm. um, in the sort of the Northern parts of UK, the Midlands, as you saw in the United States, the impact was very different because the UK actually had a pretty relatively functioning welfare mm -hmm. state under Blair and Brown. But that you come into 2010 with the series of, of cuts, particularly at the local level, and then that's where you start seeing people's politics shift. 
And mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's the only factor, but it was really, I mean, I thought that was a really compelling argument the way that was uh, the, that research and sort of explaining, you know, how, and of course, at that point, then you can draw the link, you could, or politicians could sort of falsely draw a link and say it was the foreigners that did it to you, even though it was actually domestic choices, undoing essentially the better domestic choices in the past that had protected those people from, you know, the forces of the rest of the world. So center-right politicians say we have to do austerity and cut back on the social insurance state. And the Midlands voters' response is to vote for far-right Tory politicians. Which is kind of what happened in Germany, too, to a certain yeah. degree. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me switch over to the chat window. We have our Berkeley Network for New Political Economy fearless leader Steve Vogel in chat saying, quote, to the extent that you see similar dynamics across very different political systems, US, Germany, China, is that because international economic forces overrun domestic politics? Or is it because these different political systems actually do have some commonalities? That's a good question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say yes, but um, the, no, I, I think that, uh, no, it's a great point. I mean, I think that, you know, we don't wanna, other, you know, different societies too much just because there are some pretty significant differences between them and that, you know, obviously China's political system, the US political system are very different. But at the same time, if you were going to be a bit of a cynic and you said, well, how can we have, you know, a relatively small sort of elite group dominating the heights of, of a variety of institutions and economic power you could say that characterizes most modern societies. Certainly, you know, the U.S. and China. I mean, I think there are obviously, again, a lot of important differences there. I don't want to say, that, you know, they're equivalent because they aren't. Um, you know, Germany and the U.S. Again, I think that there are a lot of interesting similarities there in terms of, you know, what politicians respond to, what business leaders say they want. You know, people who have different sort of whether they're, you know, the the urban rural divide. You know, to go really. Deep. It seems to be a sort of a universal thing in modern mm-hmm. politics. And again, this is not my expertise, but like reading about it. I mean, I remember seeing something. I don't know how they did this, but there's some sort of basically opinion polling done in China. And they tried to ask sort of non the kinds of questions that wouldn't get you in trouble for asking people questions about things. Mm-hmm. So like cultural attitudes and unsurprisingly, or maybe it's unsurprising. I, I was not surprised given what we see in, in the rest of the world, but that people in, in the kind the, you know, the coastal elites in China are much more likely to have sort of liberal internationalist perspectives on, on a lot of questions than, you know, the people in the hinterlands, um, which apparently is just like every, every other country in the world. So uh, yeah, I think that that's definitely fair. Um, and then, you know, the question of why you get different results in different places. And, you know, I think that, you know, as, as you said, international politics, you know, international or not, or sorry, economics, I mean, there's certain constraints that people face are certain consequences of, of living together in a global system and those are always going to have impacts and how you respond to those those um you know forces can be different and up to a certain extent up to you but you know those pressures are always going to be there i think um steve v do you want to follow up no i'm happy that was good okay then let me turn to steve w steve waldman who asked, quote, do we think the super rich value returns per se, or returns primarily a means of preserving rank and increasing relative difference, in which case the, quote, suffering, unquote, of the super rich from low returns may be much more than offset by the shift in the distribution of income? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that's you know, again, I'm not going to pretend to have any expert in the expertise in the psychology of, of the very rich, never having been one myself or, or knowing anyone. But I mean, this sort of anecdotally, you hear people talking about how it's about keeping score. And obviously, once you're past a certain point, you don't need the money for any con- possible future consumption need. It's It presumably is about status. And I guess this is where you'd go to sort of a, I guess, what is it, Kalecki view, right, about how the um, it's worth preserving, you know, people, even if it's against the sort of the benefit of the aggregate growth that you're, you know, your own, that is, that is collect you, right? Am I, or, or that, that, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's, I mean, that seems like a plausible explanation yeah. for some people, but it's also tricky because of course, a lot of the super rich in the United States anyway, their assets actually are generating a lot of returns, right? Like if you're the owners of a big tech company, like your profits have grown dramatically in the past 
10, 15 years. And so that really, you're, you aren't, there's no disconnect there. So I, you know, it's different for obviously other kinds of super rich, but, and in other parts of the world, it can be different, but that's, you know, makes it challenging to disentangle those forces. So that if you're actually entrepreneurial or at least risk loving, or at least like the excitement of the game, um, the global safe asset shortage actually is not viewed as a constraint as much as it is viewed by a, as a constraint by lots of people who want to put people on the board of governors of the Federal Reserve who will rapidly raise interest rates, especially now that there won't be a Republican president to be harmed by. Them. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting wrinkle to this story, which is though, if the even if the personal uh, balance sheets of the founders of these companies <laughs> might suggest that there's no trade-off, the companies, them, the balance sheets of the companies tell a somewhat different story. And so, you know, to the extent that so much of the change in, in savings and investment behavior comes, has been due to companies, both in the US and in Europe and in, you know, East Asia, you know, really? Japan, Korea, China, it's, it's really much more corporate side of things. The corporate savings, I mean, there's a paper a few years ago, the corporate savings calling it that. And I think that that's a useful way of, yeah. of thinking about this, that that's really what's been driving a lot of these shifts. And so both in terms of lower investment and higher retained earnings, you see like the large cash piles and so forth of, of companies. And so that suggests there is something going on there and that the risk aversion mm-hmm. is a problem. I mean, at the same time, like the returns for making those investments clearly wouldn't be good or they, they wouldn't be hoarding mm-hmm. the quarter cash. So that, that does suggest there really is a, a tension there. The stockholders mm-hmm. might be fine, but you know, it is showing yeah, up. In the we used to reliably believe in an investment accelerator, you know, whereby cash, corporate cash flow would flow through to more investment expenditures, whether or not the investments actually made bottom line sense you know, for the companies as well. And yet, that does no longer appear to be a big part of the world in which we now live in. Turning to Sophia Zhang, she writes, Thank you so much for coming to speak to us today, Matthew. I would love to hear your thoughts on rebalancing trade. For surplus countries like China, how can you increase demand in domestic products when Chinese consumers lack trust in domestic products or strongly prefer Western goods and services? So that's a good question. And I think, you know, a lot of people, it's very easy to sort of ascribe cultural explanations for what essentially are economic phenomena, not saying that culture doesn't matter because it, there are clearly also some interesting things we can learn from that and, and you know, differences across societies. But at the same time, you know, German thriftiness is not the reason why Germany is a trade surplus because Germans didn't suddenly, you know, mm-hmm. if the culture of German thriftiness goes back thousands of years, whether or not that's true, clearly there was some, some series break in the year 2001. So I have to look at what's, what's driving, you know, these changes. And, I, and, you know, in the case of China, an argument you hear a lot is that Chinese people just want to save more um, and they're less likely to consume. And I'm sure there's an element of that that, that is, is correct. But at the same time, if you have less money to, to buy things, then that's going to uh, affect your ability to do that. And that tends to be the, the, ch- the trend, the, you know, the changes in the sort of consumption relative to GDP and household income relative to GDP tend to be moving together in China and in other countries. So I think that drives it. If the question is, how do you raise Chinese spending, you know, of all things, including things from the rest of the world. I mean, giving people more money is the answer. And, you know, whether they, if they want to buy more stuff made from, you know, the West or Japan or what have you, then that actually would rebalance trade even faster because that would directly lead to more imports into China. Um, it would also raise incomes, of course, in those other countries of the people selling those exports to China and they might spend more on Chinese goods. So, you know, how it ultimately washes out depends on things like the distribution of income and, you know, how much people want to save, you know, in financial assets versus, you know, buying physical goods. But, um, yeah, I don't think the, the, the attitudes that Chinese consumers have about Chinese made goods shouldn't be a constraint relative to all the other things that are going on. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then let me turn to what was actually the first question put in the chat from Rakesh Bandari. That um, is, quote, on American political choices, I'm wondering whether Pettis and Klein put too little emphasis on these rather than on international macroeconomic imbalances and their consequences. Even with the foreign accumulation of the dollar assets, the negative impacts on US tradables via any foreign exchange effects could have been muted if the US government had made sensible investments rather than occupying Iraq and democratizing the purchase of granite countertops, no? Uh, 
sure there's an element of, of that i guess the question i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't disagree with the general point that there are things that could have been done better i think the sort of our one of the points we want to make clear in the book though is that you know the extent to which you know in some ways it's, it's that you know the u.s does not occupy some i mean on one hand the u.s does occupy a unique space because of the yeah. role of dollar but on the other hand the pressures that come with being a country that is you know 20 20 percent of the global economy and the rest of the world want to do different things and the impact that will have on you you know the u.s isn't capable of avoiding those things so if mm -hmm. there's certainly choices that could have been done that were better i mean sort of an obvious one being you know if essentially if there's this windfall that comes in from foreigners wanting to you know prop up the dollar and supporting you know america's ability to you know international purchasing power you could say well on the one hand we should probably you know try to relieve poverty in the U.S. To the extent that's like a thing you could do. Yeah. And you also, there are a lot of investments that are worth making, um, whether it's, you know, in infrastructure, which of course is a very broad term, but like, you know, especially now, you know, the green energy type transition could have done more to support domestic manufacturing. You could have, you know, had more housing in the right places. You know, there are obviously things that could have been done differently, but at the same time, you know, it would be tricky to pull off. One of the stories we tell in the book that I think is relevant here is, is, um, German reunification in 1871, and that might seem totally unrelated, but I promise you that it, mm -hmm. it is addressed to this, which is you have a situation where after winning the war against France in um, 1871, the new German empire gets this massive windfall in the form of French reparations payments. That's mm -hmm. equivalent to, I think about like 20, 25% of German GDP coming in, in the course of like two or three years. And there were a lot of plans on what to do with this money in ways that would be beneficial to the German economy. and you know, being a relatively authoritarian system and having it managed by a few sort of big investment banks, it was relatively centralized and there wasn't a degree of planning on how to, how to spend the money. And yet, you know, it happens to be the case in general that you get a big windfall. Countries, gen it's very hard for any society to absorb that in a productive way, even when it's, you know, master planners. And in fact, you get to the end of the 1870s and Germans basically regretted the whole thing. They wish there never been reparations because of it, the impact on them. Um, you can arguably, I think, look at you know the windfall that occurred after the formation of the euro and, and the Spain and, and so forth. And you know, Spain did a lot of things that were very useful. You know, the Spanish government did a lot of things that were very useful there. The Spanish government debt fell precipitously relative to the GDP. They built a you know world class high speed rail network, um, but they still had a lot. They were still Spanish society could not absorb that kind of money coming in that quickly. And so I think that you know, in the U.S. perspective, again, even if there are things that could have been done better. Um, it's just very challenging to, to, to really avoid kind of the excesses and waste that are associated with it. And especially at that point in time before we really, I think, appreciated um, the potential for danger, which I mean, now we do, but you know, to a degree, but then I think there really wasn't that view at all. Although there was a great, there was a great recognition of the potential for danger, but the potential for danger was going to come when the New York money center banks sold large unhedged foreign exchange derivatives and so changed the US's net invest negative net investment position from one denominated in dollars, which would have been fixed by a fall in the dollar should demand for assets in the US fall, um, to one that was fixed in terms of foreign currencies, in which case we would have been Korea in 1998. And that was a fear, and a great deal of energy went to trying to figure out how to avoid that. Energy that did not go on to figuring out how do you keep the bankruptcy of $500 billion of mortgage debt in the desert between Los Angeles and Albuquerque from causing over-leveraged money center banks to nearly collapse and bring down the whole global economy. It still amazes to me, right? that is that the Great Recession and the subsequent slow recovery was triggered by simply $500 billion of bad debt, which is a bad day on the world stock market, um, recognizing losses of that magnitude. But they were held in the wrong places by the wrong institutions that then reacted wrongly. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would, I mean, I think it was a little more than than okay. that insofar yeah. i mean this is like part of the storytelling in the book that if yeah. you know if the increase in debt and you know the monetization of home equity was boosting consumer spending and yes. you know or propping it up i guess it's not even boosting yeah. really just propping it up except that yeah. it was yeah. that impulse goes in reverse mm -hmm. 
you know, then it's a lot less surprising, I think. But yeah, I mean, this is what my friend and co-author Dean Baker says, right? That basically we were that the Great Recession was baked into cake the moment that housing prices stopped rising. Um, right. And you know, I tend to disagree. I tend to disagree largely because between 2005 and the beginning of 2008. We did move huge numbers of workers out of housing and into investment goods and export industry, and did so remarkably smoothly with no significant fall in aggregate demand, you know, at all. A little consumer weakness, but not a huge amount. Um, you know, that, and that pushes me back toward a semi-monetarist view that it's not so much the demand for savings vehicles as the demand for cash, um, for things that are regarded as safe, secure, you know, ironclad stores of value that are then not, not um, when those are not supplied, that produces the big macroeconomic distress. Um, and Rakesh, do you want to follow up? No, I think we've lost him. He's probably headed out. Question. Uh, oh, you are here. I okay. A question uh, about whether uh, we had squandered an opportunity of very cheap borrowing costs, and but I understand the the counter here that, and it, it's a it's a good corrective to look at the system internationally to see the pressures that are exerted on nation nation states by this uh, rapid movement of savings from one country to another and the difficulties of absorbing it, and I, I thought the answer about. Uh, the uh, French reparation payments to Germany was really fascinating. So I, I'm a little bit conflicted about this. I'm still thinking about it, but it was, it was a really interesting answer. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, Hobson, of course, wrote in the shadow of Marx for whom the executive of the modern state could not be anything other than a committee for managing the affairs of the bourgeoisie, albeit in a not terribly far-sighted, in fact, in a very short-sighted way, um, that a class that simply could not see that giving up some degree of wealth and power and control um, might stabilize the system, you know, and that Wessers would grab for all the money they could and then the system would, Marx thought, face its inevitable crisis because in any previous mode of production, if there was a shortage of demand, you could build a cathedral or a pyramid or kind of conquer a province. While in a capitalist market economy, you had to find something to do with the excess potential production that consumers weren't demanding that would in the long run be believed to be profit that the thing could run itself in the bubble at full employment, but not otherwise, and that eventually the piper would come calling and have to be paid. Um, now, it does amuse me to at least view the similarities between these arguments, um, at least in this interpretation of Marx and the current intellectual position of Larry Summers. Um, but, um, to what degree do you think your story, which you tell is somewhat different, would surprise Marx? And to some, what degree do you think he would view it as confirmation of his dystopian diagnosis of our long run ability to run humanities, society, and economy on the basis of private property embedded in the market economy? So I think the the you know, I'm going to answer your question by going slightly f forward in time, which is that the, the yeah. one of the reasons why Hobson is is still read frequently, you know, besides our book, is is you know Lenin Vladimir, cited him as, yes. as a Vladimir Ilyich yes. as as a primary source in his piece on imperialism, and I think that's really interesting to look at the difference between Lenin's interpretation of Hobson versus the actual Hobson, because I think that kind of I maybe gets at at your question, because I will confess I'm not an expert in, you know, actual Marx, Marx's actual specific thinking on this, but that Lenin's view was that imperialism was inevitable as a consequence of capitalism because capitalism was doomed to essentially the, you know, falling rate of profit and 
the capitalists would essentially be forced to go abroad to try to find new opportunities and eventually they would fail and that would end in war and then he thought world war one would would be it and herald global revolution but hobson's actual point was i think different and maybe this is where it gets sort of to your direct, your direct question which is that it's not that the market economy is you know inevitably going to lead to this problem it's that there are specific features of the world as it was at that point in time that are not inherent to a market economy and they're not inevitable and that can be changed that essentially lead to you know a glitch in in the system and, and these sort of and these problems and presumably you can change those specific things you can ameliorate them and come up with a, an alternative that is better and i think the sort of straightforward way of looking at this is that we have a long experience maybe not as long as it should have been but long enough of 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 seeing how you can have a you know whether you call it a mixed economy or you know governments that lean against the business cycle and engage in moderate amounts of redistribution <clears throat> that you maintain the features of <clears throat> you know market based competition and so forth or capitalism if you want to use that charge term and yet <clears throat> don't lead to these kinds of you know deep-seated problems and and ending in crises and i think you know my understanding is that essentially was hobson's view as well that he pitched himself as being a a liberal reformer a liberal actually in sort of like the classical liberal sense of reformer rather than as a revolutionary and i think that that you know to the extent that you know if we look at the the things that we say at the end of the book in terms of what we actually recommend which we're we're light on that because it's really you know more about just providing the analysis but mm -hmm. There are plenty of things that can be done by governments and around the world to ameliorate or address these problems that are really throwbacks to things that we know how to do. You don't need to reinvent the wheel or come with some very dramatic new kind of paradigm for dealing with economic problems. It's it's really that this is a an, it's a familiar problem time before, and there are solutions and approaches to dealing with that problem that have existed in the past, and we just sort of need to relearn them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then in a world in which next to nothing substantial will pass um, through the Senate without the enthusiastic approval of, say, 10 purple state senators, you know, the Portmans, the Tillises, the Collinses, the so forth, people who will value building back better as long as it can be portrayed as them doing good common sense Republican things and curbing the excesses of this strange socialist from Scranton, Pennsylvania um, named Joe Biden. Um, how indeed should America, should people interested in shaping the policies of the Biden administration in what you'd regard as a constructive dimension push? Um, what should we be advocating that the government try to do? And how should we then sell this to the purple state senators who will be the keys in getting Mitch McConnell to allow it to happen? That's a big question. Uh, you know, the second part of your question, I'm not going to answer because I don't really have any insight in that whatsoever. But the first part, you know, I would say, you know, essentially it's what we said in the book, which is, you know, the global problem is a shortage of demand. That was true before the coronavirus, and it's much, much more true now. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's sort of specific problems in, in various societies that either have to do with the distribution of income or underinvestment or both. And, uh, or, you know, the U.S. also sort of the extra peculiar one of there seems to be a strong global demand for U.S. produced financial assets. Yeah. And so <clears throat> the challenge should be how you address as many of those things as possible, you know, in a way that I would, you know, to your question, we have the politically viable is a, is a tricky one, but I mean, I, I would say, for example, you know, the extent that there is a need for updating certain, you know, basic features of, of the, the power grid, the roads and so forth, that is a thing to be done. I feel like in principle, this might be a little more controversial, but in principle, you know, defense capital goods spending is something that is, you know, a bipartisan approach. Um, you know, I don't know what prospect there is for greater social insurance or tax changes, but you know that things like that, minimum wages seem to be uh, surprisingly um, broadly based, or maybe not surprised, but broadly based, popular based on what you see in state referenda. So there's definitely an agenda there of things that could be done in the U.S. to sort of address the U.S.'s problems. But what I would stress, though, is that um, a big part of what we we try to say in the, in the book is that the the 
this is a global you know, problem. And to the extent that the US is just one, it might be the largest single component of the global economy, but it is also, you know, a small minority of the global economy relative to the rest of the world. And so you're really, you know, to the extent that the problem, the, some of the most acute problems are under consumption in other parts of the world, you have to have changes there as well. The flip side is that that means that if Europe, for example, has a real sea change in its, in its view of economic policy making, that it doesn't, it won't, be completely relevant what happens in the U.S., but that that could actually offset a lot of disappointment that people might have about what's going on in the U.S. in terms of at least the global picture. Um, so there's a mix of, you know, the, whether that's an optimistic case or not. I mean, th there's there's a lot of pieces that that really should be moving, and and it shouldn't, it cannot just be the U.S. that moves alone because it's not really the vi a viable solution. That's not going to be the best situation for the world, um, or even for the people who necessarily live here. Uh, so you really need to have you know, a broader global shift. And I think Europe is actually an area where we could potentially see some real movement. All right, so then if we think we had the last big broad global shift, at least in the North Atlantic around 1980 to 1990, um, as, you know, the Germans decided that what they needed was austerity and to curb the growth of domestic middle-class consumption in order to reinforce ordo-liberal virtue. And America decided that it needed to have much lower taxes on the rich and a much greater tolerance of super incomes in order to unleash the entrepreneurial energies of the job creators. Um, you know, these governments made their decisions based not on what was good for their economies and or even what was good for their political bases, but rather on what they believed to be good. There was this complicated dialectical interplay between the madmen in authority, the voices in the air, and the academic scribblers that led to this you know, neoliberal turn in the global north and presumably similar stories about their perception of the world that led to the turn in China. Um, what things do you see in the intellectual environment that might trigger a another, but this time a more constructive, you know, intellectual followed by policy turn um, in global political economy over the next five, 10, 15 years? I think one thing that, I mean, we'll see how long it lasts, but it seems like over the past 10 years, there has been a real shift in terms of people's willingness to care about uh, government budget constraints or believe that there are government budget constraints. And maybe that will, those concerns will reemerge depending on the you know, political circumstances. But I think that we've had enough of an experience with very low interest rates and very quiescent inflation and very, very large increases in government debt for people to realize that maybe that wasn't something they should be as concerned about. And the extent that, that becomes part of, that affects the the thinking of people who actually make policy, that could be, I think, a very big change and a constructive change because quite frankly, you know, arbitrary numerical targets don't really matter as much compared to, you know, the real economic outcomes and for that matter, you know, forward inflation expectations and so forth. And as long as those are under control, especially in a time of economic weakness, you know, that could be a, and I mean, even we're seeing in Europe to a degree as well, which is really striking uh, a little bit, but you know, that, I think that that's probably the biggest single intellectual shift that I would have identified over the past 10 years that might actually you know, lead to changes in behavior. So I should put Portman, Portman Corden, Cruz, Rubio, Scott, Phyllis, Burr, the two Georgians, Toomey and Collins on my speed dial and call them every day to say that Great Britain emerged from the Napoleonic Wars with a national debt equal to three times a year's GDP. And that by essentially ignoring that as a policy problem and pursuing high investment and industrialization, they grew out of that and then had the best century Britain had ever had. We call it the industrial revolution and keep reminding that, that the debt capacity of governments in a time when their assets are extremely high valued is truly amazing and should not be a constraint on keeping us from doing things that we should, that we could physically do. Uh, yeah, you could definitely call. I don't know how they'll, be, how they'll receive that message, but I think that's definitely a, a plausible point. I mean, you can, yeah, you could look at for that matter. Yeah, the, the U.S. at the end of World War II is, an, is another situation yeah. of, um, I mean, slightly different set of circumstances. But again, I mean, having high levels of debt. I mean, actually, even more controversially, you could say 
look at Japan, which usually mm -hmm. is used as a negative, but I think if we sort of have, you know, I've written about this before in, in, in the past in my day job, but if you look at the, um, the actual real yeah. economic circumstances of the, sort of the typical Japanese person during the period when they supposedly had these lost decades and massive increase in government debt, it was much, much better than basically most other yeah. countries in the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, but it, including places, your problem. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. And one more question from Alex Chow. What suggestion do you have for the Biden administration on China? Given um, is the, the, the Chinese government is advocating for more internal circulation, is it the right moment for, to ask China to enhance local demand through spend government spending? And how can the US government balance the competing agendas between human rights protection in China and rebuilding a healthier global economic system? Um, any thoughts on that, on rebuilding global economic integration at a time when we really do would also like to, to some degree, weaponize interdependence in an attempt to keep the Uyghurs from having as terrible a time as the Uyghurs are now having? Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, like, what counts as the totality of China policy is way outside the scope of, you know, what we talk about. But I mean, I agree it's incredibly important as a question. I think one thing that might be useful, though, is that to the extent that the Chinese government says they want to shift towards a model more of less being less reliant on exports and focusing more on you know domestic production for domestic needs, that's something they've said for a while. But to the extent that that's mm -hmm. true, that would actually be good for everyone else. And therefore, there's actually no need for the US to do anything. Um, you know, the, the Chinese government for a long time has said that they want to raise household incomes and, and shift some of these, you know, problems of distribution and, and indebtedness that they've faced. It hasn't led to results. And there's some really interesting question as to why. I mean, I think it has to do with the sort of political economy of it. And that even if it's a very authoritarian system, it turns out that China still is a country with politics and where people can resist sort of the, the goals of the central administration if they're not the number one priority. But, um, in terms from that from that sort of narrow perspective, I mean the on the economic policy front, the things that are good for the preponderance of Americans on economic policy are also good for the preponderance of people in China. So there isn't any conflict there. And so the extent, I mean, again, how that affects the actual government to government relations is a much tougher question. But at least getting outside of the framing of you know what's good for China is bad for the U.S. or or you know that China is taking advantage of the U.S. in a systematic way is 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 I think you know, getting rid of that and going past that and thinking about what's actually good for, you know, people who live in either country is a much better way of looking at it in terms of everything else. Obviously, it's much harder how you get the Chinese government to actually change policies is a very different question. But I think at least getting to the point of view of saying that Chinese people being better off makes American people better off is probably a good starting point. Okay.